right, welcome everyone to this week's installment of the colloquium. Um, we're delighted to host Dr. Ronald Mabel here today. And uh, to, to start, we'll have our land acknowledgement. Kodera University is located on the traditional homelands of the Kayabono, the Cayuga Nation. The Kayabono are members of the Sony Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary descent on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University. New York State and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Biocono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Biocono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Thank you very much. All right, so today we are actually going to have Professor Tom Campanella introduce our guest talk. Hi, everyone. Um, can you all hear and see me? Yes. OK. Um, so when I was growing up in Brooklyn, my mother, um, my mother used to uh, point to the garbage men who would come down the block um, you know, twice a week to collect the trash. And, um, and, and she would say, um, you, you know, if you don't do your studies, um, uh, you'll end up collecting trash with the uh, Department of Sanitation. Well, I, I wish my mother was still around and around to meet Robin Nagel, um, for here's a woman who clearly did her studies and did them well, uh, only to end up um, collecting trash with the Department of Sanitation. Um, Robin is a New York original. Um, if I were ever to uh, host a salon of fascinating New York souls, she'd be the very first person I'd invite. And not only because I know she would help clean up afterward. Robin's deep intellectual curiosity is trained upon the very things that the rest of us throw away. Her work is trash, quite literally. Robin is an anthropologist and ethnographer who works in the area of material culture um, known as discard studies. In her own words, she teaches and writes about, and I quote, the many forms of labor and infrastructure that waste requires, the spatial demands it imposes on urban areas, the organizational responses it inspires, and the cultural practices and attitudes that adhere to it. Robin holds a PhD and a master's degree from um, Columbia. She is uh, currently a clinical professor in the School of Liberal Studies uh, at NYU. Um, her lectures have ranged from a popular TED Talk to seminars at the Rodent Control Academy, the so-called so Rat Academy in New York City. Her most recent book is Picking Up, on the streets and behind the trucks with the sanitation workers of New York City. The book was published by FSG. It's an ethnographic study of the Department of Sanitation based on a decade's worth of work with that um, agency, including time as a uniformed sanitation worker, um, the very workers that my mother would point out. And also as the department's first and perhaps only anthropologist uh, in residence. And incidentally, my own appointment, also unsalaried, um, by um, the, the park, Parks Department as historian in residence was actually modeled on Robin's appointment with DSNY. So please join me in welcoming uh, Robin to Cornell. That is the kindest, best introduction I have ever had the privilege of. And, and I deeply thank you for that, Tom. That was very generous. Um, I'm especially excited to be here today because the Department of City and Regional Planning, to my mind, is one of the places that does best what academic goals should focus on, which is to say, theory and practice, 
highfalutin ideas and very real concrete in the world uh, consequences of those ideas. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, something, there, there are, as you might imagine, there are dozens of ways to approach the subject of waste management in pretty much any context. What I'm gonna do today is to try to blend two different perspectives. So let me open my talk and you will see what I'm, you will see what I mean, I hope. If you cannot see this, please speak because I cannot see you um, and we'll fix it if we need to. So I have two sets of questions that I wanna explore with you today. And this is the cultural side. What are the systems that allow any urban area to thrive? And connected to that question, whose history matters in thinking about the integrity and well being of those systems? And then building on that question, what counts as cultural heritage and who gets to decide that? And who's left out when those decisions are made? The parallel set of questions are more logistical. What are the basics of MSW management, municipal solid waste management? Are those basic structures successful and how do we decide that they are or are not? And should they be changed? If so, why and how? I start with this image because to me, it's the perfect synthesis of contemporary attitudes toward waste. It's from a publication that Sanitation in New York City used to publish. Um, for about 15 years, a quarterly magazine called Sweep, which was by and for department members. But this, this abdication of ownership, responsibility, connection, stewardship of the happy-go-lucky drunkard in the plaid jacket to the beer can he's just dropped on the street, that's kind of what we do with trash. We are deeply enculturated to just be able to let it go. And all right, so given that premise, what's the consequence? So I'm gonna start in 1657. This is when Peter Stuyvesant, the director general of the New Amsterdam colony at the tip of Manhattan Island, made a law that New Amsterdamers could dispose of their garbage in one of five different locations. So their pin on this illustration is at the corner of what is today Bridge and Broad Street. The land mass is the original shoreline of lower Manhattan and the web on top of it is the contemporary street grid. So this is Wall Street and Pearl. You'll notice these are all along the water's edge. This is Pearl Street and Whitehall. This is Pearl Street and what's called, what was then Coente Slip. Actually not then, there was no Coente Slip. So keep this pin in your mind's eye. This is the same, this is the same location. So all of this is fill and most of it is what we would call landfill. Made land in New York and in many other cities around the world is a solution to waste, where do you put it? And also a, a way of building real estate. A slightly different perspective on the same idea. This is the growth of the bottom of Manhattan Island from 1650 to 1980. And I will add here that during Hurricane Sandy, the flooding in, the, in lower Manhattan came to this boundary which suggests to me that all this geography we have made since the colonial era, it's borrowed. It's, it's as if mother nature said, yeah, a reminder here, it's on loan and I'm gonna take it back at some point. So this is, uh, I did not make this typo. This is a direct quote from a paper, a newspaper from the uh, middle of the 19th century. We're gonna jump ahead uh, a couple of hundred years to the state of New York City by say the 1850s. If you were a sailor, you knew you were coming into New York Harbor because you could smell it from about six miles out. Other cities had figured out how to solve the problem long before. Uh, New York politicians claimed that New York was too diverse and too crowded to be clean. We, we dumped a lot of our waste into the harbor to the point where we blocked our own shipping channels multiple times. That's the equivalent of looking at the major roadways that come into say Ithaca and just dumping garbage across them so that you cannot traverse them anymore. Um, this is kind of tongue in cheek, but uh, this, is, this is reference to animals, parks, and, and other really horrific forms of um, 
material waste that were often revisiting people when they went to beaches, like in Coney Island and the Rockaways. This is meant to be tongue in cheek. The idea here is, well, you know, if the poor could just use garbage as a source of fuel, we would solve the problem. And of course, this is actually kind of prescient because waste to energy, as incineration is now called, that is a, is a major endpoint for a lot of refuse in the world today. As you might expect, the dirtiest neighborhoods, the most garbage filled were also the most diseased, the, the, the lowest um, uh, standards of health and the highest mortality rates were in the poorest neighborhoods of the city. Um, and these uh, political cartoons were uh, a really effective way of communicating discontent and resentment of this. You didn't need to necessarily speak English at all to be able to interpret these images. Um, this is from a two-page spread in Harper's Weekly in 1895. These images tell you what the condition of the streets were for as long as anyone could remember. Um, this was so bad for so long, there was unlikely anybody alive at that point uh, who could tell you that the streets ever looked better than this. Um, so, through a whole fascinating and, and historically very rich series of scandals and reactions that I won't detail here, but that I encourage you to uh, learn about the Tammany Hall, uh, at, when it fell temporarily in the mid 1890s, a reform administration was elected and the mayor asked Teddy Roosevelt to take over street cleaning. And Teddy Roosevelt said, what are you nuts? It, it can't be done. So his second choice was Colonel George Waring, a self-proclaimed sanitary engineer and a sort of a, um, an early adapter of what today we would call public relations. He took a workforce that on a good day looked like this and he made it look like this. He put his sweepers in white uniforms for three reasons. White was already affiliated with public health and medical expertise back in that era. And he wanted the public to see his workers and, and begin to understand they are the first guardians of public health. He also gave them the same style helmet that the police of the day wore to uh, underscore their authority on the street. And of course, if you're wearing white, what I like to point out is it's a lot harder to sneak off to the pub for a pint in this blazing uniform. The carters, the ones with the horses and carts, same style, but, but brown. He made sure that the engines of the department, which back then were still horsepower, literally, were the right breed and strength. And he hired veterinarians who were responsible for maintaining the health of, of those animals. And this was basically roll call back in the day. This is where you, the workers would hitch their horses and their carts and get their um, orders for the day and they would head out. When I say orders for the day, I mean that very literally. Another change that Waring introduced that is still that held, this is still the st structure of the Department of Sanitation, which grew from the Department of Street Cleaning. He imposed a military structure. So the private equivalent is the sanitation worker on the street. And then arrayed above him in increasing hierarchy are officers. Um, the highest rank officer in the department is a four-star chief. And just as in the military, there are realms of accountability and responsibility that go with each rank, so too does the military structure within sanitation hold to that. So you're on the job, you have a, a cart and horse, you go out and you um, fill it up. You also are then, some people were responsible for a very early version of curbside recycling. Um, it's the second, I think Boston was the first, maybe Philadelphia, I don't remember, but New York was the second. Waring's goal was to pull in and then um, bring to the market materials that would let the Department of Street Cleaning fund itself so it would be independent of the city budget. This was a goal he never achieved. The problem with the recycling program was that he disenf risked disenfranchising entire communities who depended on what they could scavenge from the, the gleanings of the city. And this was mostly women and children. So again, it's a very vulnerable population and the formalization of street of curbside recycling 
put those folks at even greater risk. He was sensitive to this. And so he hired some women to be part of the, the process of, of the recycling. You can just make out here, there's a woman at the very end of this line. Um, there's a fascinating article in the New York Times from about this era of a woman who had earned her living for her entire adult life based on what she could find in the, on the streets. And she was put in charge of one of the main facilities because nobody had a better eye for sorting and thinking about monetizing and what markets would be good for what materials. So what was the consequence of this change? That the images I showed you before, the two page spread, it's a really fascinating before and after of eight different locations around Manhattan. Keep in mind that New York City at this time consists of Manhattan and the Bronx. We, we have not, the consolidation happens in 1898 when the other, we become the five boroughs. But this is, a, this is a comp, an accomplishment. It's, it's hard to overstate. I, I don't know how to overstate how extraordinary this accomplishment was. Everyone told Waring he couldn't, that it couldn't be done, it just couldn't be done. And you see the before pictures and you kind of think, well, well yeah, it probably can't be done. And yet he did it. So how do you celebrate that kind of an accomplishment? Well, you throw yourself a parade. The very first ever Labor Day parade happened in New York City in 1882. Uh, it was, a, it was an assortment of all kinds of different categories of laborers. It then became single, single categories. So you'd have cobblers and you'd have tailors and you'd have chandlers and bricklayers. And for the first time ever in May of 1896, you had street, street cleaners. The press was quite skeptical of this in the beginning, but then they noticed the crowds, right? And they noticed how many people, sorry, I have Warren animals here behind me, how many people came to cheer them on. Um, it, it, it was an annual event after uh, this was the first one. Um, this is wearing himself uh, uh, on his, uh, he was quite a horseman and this was one of his very favorite horses. And you notice he's wearing the helmet of his street sweepers to give them homage. Uh, the route went past the reservoir at 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue, which is now the main branch of the New York Public Library, but back then was this extraordinary structure. There was competition among the different districts for the best marching formation. The consequences of wear and success extended far beyond New York City. It was such a, almost a miracle that the sweepers earned the nickname White Wings and they became culture heroes. It would be as if sanitation workers today were the subject of smash movies, uh, like hit films like this one from 1931. This is City Lights. Charlie Chaplin takes a turn as a white wing and it's quite accurate. If you watch it, you'll see they, they did their homework on putting this together. This is another film called Three on a Match from 1932. But imagine if Beyonce or, or T-Swift or, I don't know, Drake were doing top 40 songs about sanitation workers and collecting garbage and cleaning the streets. That's the cultural place they were accorded back in the teens and 20s and, and early 30s. The uniform changed a little bit over time. This is, they're all still in white, um, but now the hats are like, the, as the police helmets, police hats changed, so did for sanitation. It was a three person, three man, specifically three man crew for a long time. Department of Street Cleaning became the Department of Sanitation in the 1929-1930 fiscal year. The uniforms were from that point on no longer white, but sort of standard maintenance green. This collection of people, this is my class. When I was hired into the department, these are the people with whom I was inducted when I took my pledge of to honor and uphold the laws of the city of New York and state and country. This is a more recent um, pr uh, promotion and award ceremony. All these folks with the white gloves, they've just been promoted their first step up the ladder. They're no longer sanitation workers. They are now supervisors or as they used to be called foremen. This is the toughest position in my opinion in the department because they're gonna get pressure from the people who were their peers, but are now their subordinates. And they're also gonna get pressure from every single uh, level of the hierarchy above. If you, if you have ambition to be promoted past this title, this is almost like the, this is the baptism of fire. If you can do this well, 
your potential is limitless. But a lot of people turn in the badge. You have a year to sort of say, no, no, I'm not going to do this anymore and go back to your previous rank. All right. So basics of sanitation, there are two things. You have to pick it up and you have to put it down. So picking it up, the horses and carts were the original, um, even back in the colonial era with uh, uh, in Stuyvesant's time, you, you would take it to the, to the river's edge. You would dump it into a waiting scow or barge. There's no hydraulics here, right? You have to muscle this. And, and down it goes into uh, the boat. And then you go back out for another load. These carts are roughly three cubic yards. So you can imagine you're probably gonna be making a lot of trips. Sometimes when you're dumping into the barge below, you miss that. That was a perpetual problem. This load is going to be pulled to either a landfill or to be dumped in the ocean. Uh, and you notice it's not netted, right? So think of even a gentle breeze is gonna take a lot of that into the water if the boat sails at all. There was a great story about someone who positioned a barge in the East River in lower Manhattan and invited the city to use it as a dumping barge. Um, it had no bottom. So the fellow had the sort of illogic of, well, if we just dump enough garbage in it, I will have made land. And so even then real estate in lower Manhattan was a, a pretty hot commodity. This image is a little hard to read, but there are human beings here. Um, just as there are entire families that survive by what they could glean from the streets, these folks are doing two things. They are they're called scow trimmers. So to trim the scow means they'll, they'll make sure that the load is balanced before the tugboat pulls it out to sea. Um, and they're also retrieving things that either they can eat or they can sell. And under the piers are their wives and children and cousins and friends who are sorting that material to take it to market. They lived here year round. This is a, there's not been a lot of work done on these communities. Uh, the press that talked about them was quite derogatory and sarcastic. Um, but this was the make or break of, of it's like a, uh, not an underground community, but a below the docks community. Um, and this was what the work took. Uh, this, uh, you may know that Thomas Edison did a series of really lovely little vignettes of the city, partly to test his new, um, these newfangled things, these sort of, you know, film cameras. Um, the people on the scow here are mostly Italians. Uh, by this point, the people on the dock at, with the carts are mostly Irish. There were city council hearings during Warren's tenure uh, suggesting that maybe this work was dangerous and unhealthy. And Waring said, oh, he's on the record saying, oh, no, no, it's fine because they're Italian. If you or I tried to do this work, of course we would get sick, but Italians are inherently suited to difficult, dangerous, risky outdoor labor, and they're gonna just live happily ever after. I will also point out no one's wearing a face mask or a respirator. There's no occupational safety and health authority looking over this. Remember that underneath are the children and wives and cousins and friends who are helping sort this material. Um, it, this is a remarkable little mini document here. And can I advance to the next slide? Yes. So the barge is full, it's pulled out to its tipping place. It might be going to a landfill or it might be going into the sea. Uh, dumping in the harbor was made illegal in the 1880s. They're supposed to go at least not, uh, six, 17 nautical miles from shore. And by shore, I mean like Coney Island and the New York Bight, um, Staten Island. If they could bribe the harbor master or if the harbor master were willing to look the other way, they could, they could shorten this trip. Um, which often happened. They offloaded in this extremely precarious, uh, almost it, it almost looks like a caricature of this couldn't possibly be how the labor was organized, but in fact it was. And you see fellows like this, that looks really dangerous. And in fact, it was. There are accounts uh, rather frequently of people doing this work who fell in and were not rescued. So I haven't done a deep dive into that research. I invite any of you who might want to, to take that up. Um, their stories have not been told and I'm certain that they are rich and deserve to be told. All right, so you pick it up and then you put it down. We were finally outlawed from dumping at sea 
1934 by a United States Supreme Court order. So in response to that, we did two things. We greatly expanded the number of incinerators that were used throughout the, the, um, the region. And we also uh, greatly expanded the number, of, the number of landfills. So this is just a partial list of, of landfills all over the city. Robert Moses had a very significant hand in this. Um, by the mid 90s, we only had one landfill left and that was Fresh Kills. This is obviously not to scale, but just to show you where it is on the sort of west central coast of Staten Island. This is what it looked like in 1943. Dumping started in April of 1948. Robert Moses said, look, I, I'm only gonna dump there for three years and we're gonna fill in all this swampy mosquito ridden useless land we're going to make land actually from these swamps and we're going to turn it into this uh, residential and recreational and industrial facility. But as you may know, the three years turned into many more years than that. Um, and even though landfill technology was advanced beyond what it just making a dump, this is what you would have seen at Fresh Kills in the um, late 1940s, early 1950s, looking in one direction. And if you turned and looked in the opposite direction, this is what you saw. This is not a landfill, this is a dump. And there's a very significant difference between them. A dump is just dropping garbage and it's gonna leach, it's gonna contaminate groundwater, it's going to send toxins wherever they might may go. This is a dump. A landfill is a highly engineered, uh, and, and far more stable. It's not perfect at all, but it's far more stable and less deeply damaging than a dump. Um, Fresh Kills became a landfill over time. That's a story that was recently told in great detail by the historian Martin Melosi, um, who wrote the magisterial book. It's a 700 page work all about Fresh Kills. I highly recommend it. So we're still pulling, we're still using barges and, and uh, tugboats but now they're going to fresh kills. The technology was um, uh, as advanced as it could be for the day. These are cable cranes unloading directly from the barges into three-sided athe wagons. There are no roads because these are being pulled by tractor. They are taken up to the, uh, the active face and tipped. This is the supervisor's office, if you will, which is also pulled around to the active face, the active bank. Um, one of those has been restored at Fresh Kills. Some of the folks who were there near the end before it closed did that work. It changed over time, especially after the 90s when it became the only place New York City had for disposing of waste. You have here, it's sort of a good illustration. You have barges waiting to be offloaded. You have barges that are empty waiting to be taken back out. And then off on the horizon out of this picture are barges in transit either to the transfer station or from the transfer station. We don't have cable cranes anymore. It was these hydraulic cranes. And instead of taking them directly from the barge to the truck, they went to a, what were called pads. Um, this is a pay hauler. That's the cab, just for scale. This is a front end loader. This is approximately the same tonnage in the bucket of this FEL as, as about one and a half garbage trucks. This is a class that I had out at Fresh Kills before it closed. Um, next to one of those FELs, just so you have a sense of the scale. This is the, the pay haulers and the compactors on the open face. And then this is a more detailed picture of what happens of a, to a landfill as it's closed. You see that the waste is down here. This is anywhere from six to 12 feet. And as the methane and other gases and the leachate subsides and is pulled out, the leachate goes through water treatment and the methane and other gases go through the national grid, um, this infrastructure will be, will be pulled out. This map I've always loved. It was published in 1995 when Fresh Kills was still in full swing as a landfill. And look what it's called. Fresh Kills Park, undeveloped. If I dropped into New York from who knows where and I'm using this map and I'm like, oh, let's take the kids for a lovely picnic at Fresh Kills Park in 1995, that would have been a rude surprise, but it points to a fascinating element of working with forms of waste in one's scholarly endeavors, which is it gets euphem euphemistically 
termed a lot. It gets, one of my deans said to me once years ago, oh, Robin, couldn't you call it something else? When I told her I worked on questions of trash and garbage, like, mm, that's fascinating. Why would we call it something else? Why can't we say landfill? At this point, nobody, there was not a closure plan. Fresh Kills was supposed to still be open for decades, but we can't say that. All right, just so you have a sense of size, if Fresh Kills acreage were on top of Manhattan, this is its extent, all the way to 26th Street, coast to coast. It is vast. You can't see the whole thing from any single vantage point while you're standing there. You can only see the whole thing from an aerial perspective. And this is what it may become as it, as it is, it, it, it closed officially in 2001. It was reopened for the September 11th um, uh, city's response. And I don't, I don't talk about that here, although I'm happy to take questions about that, but um, it will become a park, but it'll be another 30 years before it's fully accessible to the public. Uh, there are discovery days. And if you're in the area and there's one scheduled, I highly recommend um, going out there because it's one of the few times you can explore it. Um, I don't know when they'll have them post COVID. The last barge sailed in, it was March 21st, I believe, 2001. So what do we do with our garbage now? That there's no place within the boundaries of New York City to take trash. This map is a little out of date, but basically it's talking about all the different places that our garbage now goes. Um, we are colonizing parts of the country very far from New York. And I, I often wonder, archeologists in 500 years, when they're digging up over here, right? Or they're digging up down here and they find, they find New York City debris. Like what, how are they gonna, what are they gonna, what conclusions will they draw? Okay, so this is more on the cultural side of things. Sanitation has a legacy as a, as a department, as a presence, as a workforce, as a, a set of infrastructures, as an almost perpetually controversial political entity. But the legacy of the people who work there, it is a generational, um, department. There are, I met a man whose grandfather was one of the people who used the horse and cart. This is the, the brass band, which was world famous at its height in the, in the fifties. We now have an award-winning pipe and drum band, which, um, first debuted in the early, in fact, at a funeral for a sanitation worker. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The, Infrastructure, the architectural legacy, I think is quite compelling, but you don't have people often saying, yeah, it used to be an incinerator, we should preserve it. This is the interior of the 215th street uh, of, of this building. It's ghost-like in its ruination and the, the dust. And I find a deep beauty in this kind of thing. I mentioned Sweep Magazine before, this is an example of it. And this is the kind of thing that was included in sweep and I, I love this like little game of pictures whose son is whose child right these guys you might guess they're related this um chief doyle is now retired and his son here as a an entry-level sanitation worker is now an officer i was curious and and tom mentioned the rat academy uh robert um why am i blanking corrigan is the, the mastermind behind the Rat Academy, uh, one of the world's experts on rats. And he said to me, when did New York switch from garbage cans to plastic bags? And Sweet Magazine had the answer. It was between the summer of 1969 and, and the second half of the 1970s when this uh, transition happened. Thereby, I will add, creating what Corrigan calls Rattopia. This is how the assignments board used to be organized. These little pieces are, this is a piece of cardboard basically. And the color coding, um, it gets a little Talmudic reading the details of this. Um, I never was particularly good at it, but you can, it's a snapshot of the entire culture of a given garage. This is how it works today, even more colorful. And to my mind, even more intricate, also more complete. Sanitation and refuse collection work, has been, uh, it is the, one of the 10 most dangerous jobs in the country and has been for many, many years. Uh, it fluctuates from number four or number seven. It, it depends on the, the particular year, but this is according to the 
Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics. These two trucks were in two separate accidents, but both of the workers were killed. This is a funeral for a sanitation worker killed on the job a few years ago. It's the same as when a police officer or a firefighter is killed, except sanitation dress that's dress green instead of dress blues. Um, and it won't get it won't get press. It won't get the front page. Um, I mentioned the pipe and drum band. Their first uh, their their debut after they had been working and practicing for several years was at the funeral of a sanitation worker in 1996 who was killed when he tossed a black garbage bag of household waste into the back of the truck. The blade of the hopper caught it, popped it open, and it turned out that that seemingly innocuous bag held a jug of hydrofluoric acid. And I will not go into the details of what happened next, but it's probably one of the most gruesome ways you could possibly die. On a cheerier note, sanitation has had an artist in residence since the very early 1990s. Meryl Euclid's first work was a performance piece in which she shook hands with every single sanitation worker in the entire city and said to them, thank you for keeping New York City alive. That's key, not just clean, not just looking a little bit better, but alive because we could not be the glittering global capital we imagine ourselves to be if these first guardians of public health were not out there every day. This is one of her sculptures. She clad a collection truck in mirrors so that we might remember when we see ourselves reflected in it. We generate what goes on the inside of it. This is uh, when the mirror truck was at one of the uh, armory art shows, just by way of timing. So that's me. And this being is now 22. So this is a little while ago. And that's Meryl, it's a more recent photograph of Meryl, whose birthday, I will point out, I believe she'll be 81 tomorrow. Um, special events cleanups, of course, sanitation is there. This is a ticker tape parade from the 1980s. And this is one, I think this was after, this might've been the Women's World Cup or it might've been the Super Bowl, I don't remember. Uh, some of the equipment that you use for ticker tape cleanup is the same as what you use for heavy snow. This is the Times Square ball drop. The, um, they're cleaning before the ball drop and then of course they move in afterwards. This is the Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods in the city at Passover have to burn uh, anything that has been touched by anything leavened. So that generates forms of waste that uh, sanitation is on hand for. We have an honor guard um, for promotion and award ceremonies, also for funerals. I mentioned it was a three man crew. Women were first hired into the uniformed ranks in 1986. This is Carla Sanderson and Gloria Pabon, the very first women on the job. There are now uh, only about 3% of the uniform workforce includes women, not because they are kept from the job, but I think because it's not necessarily the first career that a lot of women think of, but they are at every rank um, and fulfilling every duty. The labor history of Teamsters Local 831 is um, quite rich. This is the strike of 1968, it was nine days in February. It inspired the much more famous, and I will say consequential strike of the Memphis sanitation workers shortly thereafter. Um, you may recall that um, the Memphis workers asked Dr. Martin Luther King to come and help them because while the New York strike only lasted nine days, this strike went on and on and on. And the workers seemed to be getting nowhere with management. Dr. King was hesitant to, to come, but he very much believed in the cause. Um, but in April of 1968 in Memphis, that's where he was assassinated. So the New York City Union 831 feels a, a, a very strong tie to all kinds of different civil rights legacies, but in particular, this strike and the death of, of Dr. King. This is the headquarters of the department. It's in Lower Manhattan on Worth Street. I include this picture just to, again, underscore health. Hospitals is no longer headquartered here, but health and sanitation, they're here. This was a from a long stretch of big, called sausage bags or body bags that someone had turned into a kind of robe artwork with these statements 
on these piles of waste, which I, I found very whimsical and in fact, quite accurate. Um, again, looking at architectural heritage, this is that same 215th Street incinerator where I showed you the sort of ruination of the inside. I find, I find a grace, a kind of a, a visual, something visually, there's a harmony to this structure. And why can't we decide to preserve it and use it to celebrate the cultural history of the department? This is behind a def defunct incinerator in Queens. And I like this image for similar reasons. There's a sort of a dark poetry to this. You have human, the remains of, of our loved ones squeezed cheek to jowl in a very crowded cemetery, just as you have the last, the next to the last place of material objects. I mean, there's just sort of the same thing. Although I'm not saying that garbage that goes through an incinerator is the same as a dead human being. I am not saying that. And yet there are similarities here. This again is just looking, this is a current view from Fresh Kills to Lower Manhattan. This I want to point out, this is from Annie Leonard's work in the story of stuff. Municipal solid waste, which is when we say garbage, this is sort of what we tend to think of. It's a very small portion of the entire waste stream. And this, of course, gets broken out into many, many subcategories. Um, but I just want to point out that with all of the regulatory and activist attention on things like recycling, that's great. However, off stage and out of the public eye are these much bigger categories. This is in my early field work. This is when I was first coming to know the department before I was hired as a sanitation worker. They let me um, go out with the trucks and fling garbage. And um, Polly Ingram was one of the very, very first people I met. And this picture was included in the a sanitation newsletter. And, and I've always felt a little bad about it because um, his wife got really mad and uh, that I, would, I did, absolutely did not intend for that to happen. This is a pitch for my book. Um, it tells this story and much more. Uh, the basic premise is what is it to be a sanitation worker in the city of New York and why should anybody care to know? Um, and then I'm just gonna conclude with a little bit of the parade. Again, this is, a, um, this is from uh, Edison. If it will roll, please roll. There we go. Yes, so this is 1903. Um, I love this little, I love this little video for many reasons, but one of them is I want to, I want to like holler at these guys a little bit because many of these ranks are out of step. I'm like, come on, it's left, 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 right. Well, you can do this, right? But some of them are not like, they, they need somebody hollering the, hollering the cadence. So I'm going to stop there. I've gone on a little long. Um, yeah, and I'm glad to take questions and discussion and um, I'm, I'm not sure who moderates that. Uh, I'm happy to not, uh, I can see you all as a distant group of people. Um, yeah, so, hello. Hi, Robin. I cannot. Uh, thank you so much for that incredible lecture. Uh, we teach in planning for life of cities, but I think so many of our students, all of these aspects are really out of the public eye. I don't think many of us have been to, if I ask for a show of hands, how many of you have been to a landfill before? Oh, all right. Okay, maybe this is a biased sample. <laughs> because of your lecture. How many of you have been to a wastewater treatment plant? Okay, good for you. Okay, uh, how many have you been to a coal power factory, like power project? Right. So a lot of these are so hidden in, and they have such rich infrastructural and social histories. And I'm so grateful for your presentation today. So we'll now open up for Q and A. And um, as with our other online speakers before, I invite you to come down. You're going to stand before here just like I am, and then. Give your question to um, to Dr. Nagel so that she can hear you. If you are online, uh, you are also welcome to ask a question. Just raise your hand, and then Alexis will know to call on you. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
take some questions. May, may I make a re request? Yes. When speaking, if, if anybody speaking would be willing to, to talk a little bit slower than normal, because between the mask and the microphone and the Zoom and up, I'm, I am having, a, I can hear you fine. I'm just having a little trouble understanding everything you're saying. And I'm sure that's not you, that's just all the tech sort of layered up. Absolutely. Hi there, Dr. Nagel. Uh, my name yeah. is Nathan. Uh, I thought your talk here was supremely interesting. And I have a question. Uh, you showed some of the early women back in the 1800s and other people that would sort through trash and take items out for their own use or they saw some sort of value in them. Uh, do you think that today uh, people should have rights to garbage, to dumpster dive, to take those items out? Or is there some sort of institutional reason uh, from your expertise working in sanitation that that's unsafe or we should not permit that? It's a fascinating question, Nathan. Thank you. That um, In New York City, once municipal waste is at the curb, it no longer belongs to the household that created it. It belongs to the city of New York. So technically, if somebody decides to go through household waste and retrieve things, um, you're stealing from the city. I have only seen this enforced when people come with trucks or other vehicles to take large quantities of recyclables because the city pays the, the private vendors who have our, the contracts for those commodities, they're called. Um, so technically, then that's theft from. Sims Metal Management, if it's uh, plastic glass or, or metal, or Pratt paper, if it's, um, if it's paper recycling. And if you are walking down the street in New York and you see, and, and you can, especially in affluent neighborhoods, you see this all the time on garbage day, a piece of furniture or some pretty nice clothing or something, electronics. And you, you're looking at it, you're thinking, huh, that actually looks okay. I, I, I need a table like that or a chair or whatever it is. And you take that home. Yeah, you've broken the law, but I've never heard of that being enforced. Um, and there's a lovely slang for it. You are, um, it's a, a, a noun. That thing that you retrieve from the curb is, is Mongo. Um, and it's also a verb. People would say to me, do you Mongo? And I would say, yes, enthusiastically, I'm Mongo. Um, other people, especially on the job, would never, ever, ever Mongo. Their logic is somebody threw it away. That's good enough for me. It's garbage. The dumpster diving issue. So I, I, I didn't clarify this at the beginning. The Department of Sanitation is responsible for household waste and nonprofits. Businesses have to have a contract with a private carter. And so if it's outside of or connected to a grocery store or a shop or an office, that garbage belongs to the private carter. Dumpster diving then becomes something that the business itself may want to prevent you from doing for a variety of reasons. One may be if you're climbing in my dumpster and you get hurt, I, might, I may be liable and you could sue me. But a, a more common reason is if you're climbing in my dumpster and retrieving food or clothing or whatever fills that dumpster, that means you're not buying those things in my store. And I want you to buy those things in my store. So I'm gonna tear the clothes or poison the food, which is a common, that, that happens. Um, so it, it, it's, you, you can do it. The business may ask you not to or make it not a useful practice or a dangerous one. I mean, poison food, that's not something obviously you wanna take home. I do take students out with freegans um, and just to see the quantity and quality of food waste that's on the street every night, basically. Um, I'm sure it's hundreds of tons cumulative across, across the city. But I think dumpster diving is a great kind of rogue way to divert material that doesn't need to be thrown out and that can, have, um, can still have a life, so to speak. I can talk about this in great detail and for a long, long time. But I think, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hi, 
Uh, first, I just want to say I picked up your book at the Tenement Museum this summer and I read it in like three days. It was awesome. So I was so excited that, to see that Cornell brought you into talk. Um, I have a couple questions. Tell me your name. Uh, Laurel. I would love to hear a little more about the uh, Rat Academy, <laughs> their history and what they do. Um, and what sort of like changes do you see coming in the future for New York? waste management in terms of like composting and like what might change in terms of landfills and stuff like that. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you, Laurel. Um, so Rat Academy, uh, it's a three-day program. I've been a student and I also guest lecturer now. Um, the point is for you to learn as a student of the Rat Academy, what can you do to prevent rat and mouse and other forms of vermin infestations in your home, in your business. Um, Corrigan has been doing this. In fact, he started as a pest control, uh, sort of, he started his career when he was going to college and needed a way to earn money to pay tuition. So he answered an ad for an exterminator and um, didn't know anything about it, but quickly became fascinated by the critters that he's being charged with um, either controlling or killing. And he went on to get his PhD in biology with a specialization in rodentology. Um, and one of the many gifts that he brings to his work, and he's a guest lecturer in, in my classes often, is his deep respect for the animals he has come to know so well, even as it's his job to figure out how to keep them in check. Um, so the, the Rodent Academy goes through, it's, it's a very practical set of, um, responses and potential solutions. And he, he also, on the third day, he sends his students out into different areas of the city with, now we know what to look for. Um, it's kind of a rodent-focused Sherlock Holmes interpretation of clues and signs that the average person would never notice, but that once he's taught you, you begin to see traces and, and, and evidence of our, um, I'm going to call them our uh, neighbors, these are rat and mouse neighbors, among others. Um, so that's the, that's the gist of it. When I give a talk, I share some of the slides I've shared with you today, but then I also um, have a, a section about the role of bacteriology and things like the first diphtheria vaccination in the world was developed by the New York City Department of Health in the 19 teens. Um, and understanding the connection between germ theory and antibiotics and rats and mice and the kinds of diseases that they spread through garbage. The more garbage we have on the street, especially in plastic bags, the more access, the easier it is for rats to have a great, have a great feast pretty much every day. I will also tell you if you see garbage bags that are minted, mint scented, and it's supposed to deter uh, critters from breaking into them, all it will do is give them fresh breath. It will not deter them. So don't spend the extra money. Um, in terms of the future of waste management in New York City, composting, as, as you may know, has, has kind of had a stop and start existence. The previous commissioner of sanitation, Catherine Garcia, was an ardent advocate and she helped put in place the infrastructural requirements to make it happen. When, the, when COVID descended on us, that was one of the first programs that got cut. It's being restored, but instead of rolling it out as a mandatory program across the city, neighborhood by neighborhood, it's now done on a volunteer basis, but with lots of encouragement for, for buildings and, and uh, nonprofits to sign up for this. The economics of it don't don't make sense from a certain perspective yet, because when you calculate the cost of the labor, the cost of the transportation and, this, and the tonnage that is collected, the tonnage is very small. And so it works out to a pretty hefty per ton cost at this stage. But how do we begin to inspire people to change their discard habits, even just a little bit so that the food that could become compost has a different route and does not become waste. If it, one of the justifications of the Garcia administration was, yeah, it's costing some money now, 
but that's because it's new and public education is always a little bit slow to catch up with the goals of any kind of new initiative. Um, in terms of the longer term future, my dream is that we don't have marine transfer stations where, or rail transfer stations where we're dumping the garbage from collection trucks into larger vessels that then go to some place to a landfill or incinerator, but that we have reuse and repair centers where um, material, maybe it has to be discarded or maybe it can be pulled apart into its components and those can be reused. And certainly in terms of creating jobs, that's far more, that has far more promise than just throwing it all away. The scale of those facilities and that infrastructure is so large and complex, you need very few workers to make that go. Whereas a reuse or repair, kind of like that slide I showed you of the people sitting in a line with the woman at the very end um, sorting material. I would love to see that come back. And then also, if the United States had robust extended producer responsibility laws, meaning I, I'm the producer of the refrigerator or the soda <coughs> can, and when it's done and empty, I have to take that back and, and recycle it and make sure that it does not become waste. There are laws like that in other parts of the world. We don't really have much of that yet. That would change the structure of garbage management in the city and, and across the country. So those are just a few things. Thank you. I see a, see a Zoom hand. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to call on them in the order in which they appeared. And uh, what you just said was an excellent segue to what I assume will be uh, the nature of Jenny's question. So that is really cool. I didn't understand anything you just said. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Minner. Uh, I teach here at Cornell. I love your talk. I mean, I just, it's just beautiful. The, the way that you've incorporated human stories, uh, you touch on cultural heritage, um, so many aspects of society and the city, the history of the city. So um, I'm involved in a group, a coalition of different organizations that are looking at called Crowd, Circularity, Reuse and Zero Waste Development. And we've been primarily concerned with the with the built environment. So the full spectrum of adaptive reuse, keeping buildings uh, repaired and operational to deconstruction. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, I mean, you've made a very specific decision to focus on municipal solid waste. Is that there more that you could say about deconstruction and reuse of construction and demolition materials. Um, I would love to hear more about that. Uh, sure. Um, with the caveat that you're, you're correct, it's not entirely my area of expertise. Um, I mentioned in the description of this talk that household waste accounts for roughly 12,000 tons a day. And the other two categories are commercial or business waste and C and D, construction and demolition debris. If you are Carter in charge of, and, and you collect C and D, that's a whole separate set of permits um, because of the understanding that there are different potential toxins in, for example, when sheetrock is broken down and becomes dust, um, what are people, what's the risk to air quality as just one small example. Um, in terms of sort of adaptive reuse, as, as I'm sure you know far better than I, with the example of New York City, we are not good at that. We are good at tearing down beautiful classic old architecture like Penn, the original Penn Station and then making, I'm gonna reveal a, a deep bias here, these glass boxes that are just glass boxes. Very, very sad. Anyway, um, what I would like to see happen in the context of municipal uh, architecture is, is that facilities, especially older ones that have housed and been the, the, the central work hub for workers whose jobs make the difference in the quality of our lives in, in New York, that we decide to honor those, we decide to preserve, we decide to restore. Um, even just a few examples of those, I'm not talking every, 
every firehouse or every sanitation garage. But um, for example, there's one in Queens in Astoria. It's the Queens West One garage. It was built in the 1920s. It is falling. It is it is in such disrepair that some of the walls have like come apart. Like they're not even attached to each other anymore. The workers there are going to be relocated to a new building. That building, I'm sure, will be um, torn down. But why not instead restore it and have it be the home for the Museum of Sanitation, which is a project that we are working on. It's slow, but it's it's moving forward. Um, but that then points to how do we rewrite public value of understandings of respect for categories of of categories of labor that, like Tom said in his introduction, he was cautioned like if you don't do well, you're going to be a garbage man, quote unquote, which is just so you know an archaic. It's it's considered an, an insult to say garbage man now. Um, sanitation worker in New York is the preferred title, but. So how do we, when I show the early pictures of the, of the map with the landfill that is lower Manhattan, how cool would it be if we knew the names of the people who did the work to build that land? If we knew the names of the people who said, oh, okay, here's what we do. We get these big logs, we make these cribs. We, the the archaeology of this is fascinating that they could engineer this stuff back in the, you know, the 18th century to build land that we now put skyscrapers on. Um, I'm meandering a lot in my answer here, um, but I think a key component, if it's a piece of architecture or, or a, um, if there's a structure that deserves preservation and, and reuse and redefinition, it, that comes back to this grounding of how do we value the labor on which we depend? And how do we re, rewrite, reconfigure our relationship to those forms of labor and the people who do them? Why don't we have parades for sanitation workers anymore? Um, yeah, so as I say, I'm meandering a little bit, but that's, that's a partial answer. Thank you. Uh, right. um, Nima, why don't you go ahead since we have a really good question for that? Can I call on Zoe? And then we can call on Zoe. Sorry, um, if there's someone else who has a related question from the audience, so we'll take that question and then Zoe, I'll call on you next. Okay. Um, hi, my name's Nima Kudban. I'm one of Jenny's colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, you know, I had a related question in terms of the label piece and which is why Linda's asked me to come in now. So, I work on similar questions, but in places across India, right? And of course, you know, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the ways in which these questions of waste and trash and recycling work themselves out in, in you know, across the global South. But what I'm fascinated by is in your, you know, the father-son connection and the labor hierarchies, right? So the labor piece that is so much a part of your work you, you talk about how there is, you know, the ways in which sanitation workers become part of this community and often there's a familial connection. In the parts of the world where I work, it's pejorative work, it's dirty work like it is in New York. And the, the, some of the cities where I work, I mean, these are cities that have been around for 3000 years, right? 2000 years. And you have communities of people who have been collecting waste. And that becomes that by caste and by occupation, they fall into those places. So it, what's fascinating for me is this conversation, you know, is the way your work is talking about labor and technology and the work becomes cleaner and cleaner and more protected and even celebrated in some ways within the community itself, if not to other people. And yet it continues to be as pejorative as as uh, reviled. And, you know, and in the South, in the global South, one of the attempts is to bring technology, thinking that it will remove the pejorative edge. So I'm very, I'm quite fascinated by that question of dirt, pollution, its conversion to caste in, in parts of the world which have been urban for thousands of years. 
and the way New York's been dealing with it. And I, I, I just wanted to hear your comment on that. You know, where you think, what you think is happening? Because of course, where I work, so much of the garbage is recycled because it's sold. It's a huge industry, nothing like America, right? And so very curious. So just so I'm clear what you're asking, um, you want me to comment on sort of the stigma and the how, how the workers sort of wear the label and the, how technology has affected that? Yes, and, and how in a way we find that there is still a familial labor occupation pattern, which makes me wonder whether we can ever break out of the kind of caste hierarchies, right? And the community hierarchies that we've used across the world for, for waste collection. Can we ever, if in a place like New York, with all its money and wealth and technology, they haven't been able to break, break out of the tight occupational sort of familial hold on the occupation, right? Is it because you get, is it because you get like pigeonholed into something and you're permanently, you stay there and that's the only job you can get? Why is it? Why is it that there's that connection? So when I first started field work, I went into the project assuming that sanitation workers are keenly aware of and deeply burdened by the stigma that adheres to the title sanitation worker or quote unquote garbage man. What I figured out over time was that they, they know that the public looks down on their job title, but in the world of sanitation, they don't really care. That's not their, that's not a concern that they carry with them every day. They, every single person who shared examples with me of like um, expressions of disrespect, everybody on the job had those expressions, had experienced various signs of disrespect while they're on the job. But the far more important measure for them was how well respected are they within the context of the garage where they are? How, how respectful and effective is the superintendent who's their boss? Um, so that's the idea that they wear the stigma that they carry it as a burden. It's far less of a factor than I had assumed it was as a, when I was an outsider first coming in. The other thing about New York City sanitation, and this is very different from many, many of the systems in the global south, it's, it, once you are past the initial starting salary, which is not that, it's about $34,000 a year right now, um, you begin to earn more money through overtime and through a tier of raises that uh, kick in as you uh, accumulate seniority. The benefits are excellent far, far better than what they are teaching at a university. You have, a, uh, if you're a new hire now, it's a 22 year pension, which means after 22 years, you then receive for life, half your salary untaxed for life. So let's say you have to be 21 to take the job. So you retire at 43, 43, 43 is way in my rear view mirror. And if I had retired at 43 and I'm still earning half my salary from when I was a sanitation worker for the city. And now I have this, whatever is my next career. And I have medical benefits for life for myself and my family. It's a great job. It's a great job. Stigma and the public attitude, eh, whatever. Within the job itself, the workers have told me, we are sanitation workers, but we know some people that we call garbage men because they don't do the job well. They are themselves quite slovenly. They, they are willing to let other people take up the slack for what is their responsibility. So um, I think as outsiders, it's easy for us to say, wow, they must really, they must really, it must be a real burden to have the, the stigma that goes along with the, the public perception of what they do. But in fact, they, that's not a very vivid part of their, of their work. I will say in terms of the legacy, in fact, the guy who told me the story about his grandfather, who was one of the people in the horse and cart, when that fellow was brand new on the job and he shows up at the stables for his first day 
and they give him a cart and a horse and they, he says, well, what's my route? And they say, don't worry, the horse, the horse knows the route. And sure enough, they leave the stables, they go a few blocks, they turn right and they get to a pub and the horse stops <laughs> and will not, will not continue until this new worker, the fellow's grandfather gets down from the cart, goes into the pub, counts to 10, comes back out, and then the horse is ready to go. Because the previous guy who worked with that horse, that's what he did every morning. Um, and the horse was very used to, was very used to that rhythm. Um, but the, the legacy, when I talked about things like the band and things like Sweet Magazine, I did not mention the benevolent societies. The social side of the job is really rich. And the kinds of connections that people make doing difficult work side by side over years forges bonds of friendship that are I, I'm envious of the kinds of ties that I see in the department that I, I don't see often in academic contexts. So, um, but I'm, I'm gonna leave it there because I'm gonna be sure to get to Zoe. Hi, Dr. Nagel, thank you so much. Um, I am curious about trash removal at major sports events in the city. So like Knicks games at Madison Square and Yankee games at Yankee Stadium, things like that. So does trash there follow the same systems as private households, like once it's discarded from the stadium, is it then property of the city? No, because those are businesses, the, um, once it's discarded from the stadiums, it's the property of the private carter that has the contract with the Yankees or the Mets or with uh, the Meadowlands, wherever, whatever is the stadium. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a real push in some parts of the country to make all of that far less garbagey and more sustainable. Um, uh, the, the label sustainable, of course, has become ubiquitous and sometimes meaningless. So those initiatives look, they have specific parameters in different places. Um, but uh, it actually points to one of the consequences of COVID is an absolute spike in disposables of PPE, but also things like when I go to a restaurant in New York and I used to be served on you know, uh, uh, China with uh, utensils that were made of metal, now that's all paper and plastic. Um, so, and I haven't been to Shea, well, Shea, it's not even Shea anymore, City Field or Yankee Stadium in many years. Um, but I, I, I'm gonna guess that they still generate pretty serious tonnages, probably for every game. But that's gonna fall to a private carter and the regulations around, um, business business there's a, something called the business integrity commission that is the government body that has the oversight for private carding oh and zoe if you want a great book about how private carding was pulled out of m mafia control in the 90s mm -hmm. it's it's called takedown mm -hmm. uh, the author's last name is cowan i will put it in um i think it's one word the author is, uh, I forget if it's Dan or Dave Cowan, but that's a, that's a good book all about private carding and the, trans, the transformation from the 90s to now. Great, thank you so much. Hi Robin, yeah, thanks so much for your talk today. Um, my name is Adam. Um, Ad so Adam, can I just point out when, when you all look at me, I see the bottoms of your chin. Right, you I'll look at the camera. camera. There you go. And now, and I look at my camera, and then it's as if we're looking at each other. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was curious, you know, as you touched on, uh, nowadays most trash from New York City, and I think a lot of big cities, is sent to rural parts of the country for disposal. You know, oftentimes very large landfills. And there's one about an hour north of here that is, in my opinion, quite large. Not as large as um, uh, fresh kill, but still pretty sizable. And I was curious if there are any, um, in addition to just the money transfer, if there's any programs that deal with the negative externalities to the communities there, um, if there's anything from the city side or the private um, third parties that manage those landfills, um, if they do anything for those communities to address the fact that they have a lot of, you know, pollution and smell and just the visual impact um, associated with all that. Yeah, so I think the, the landfill you're talking about is Seneca Meadows. Yeah, which, that's, yeah. yeah um, and I know that there's a, a 
very um, vocal group that would love to see that shut down for all kinds of good reasons. If a community becomes what's called a host to a landfill, they negotiate um, contracts that can be quite lucrative for that community. There's um, a smaller landfill in Pennsylvania that got some newspaper coverage because they, the town that hosted them had been um, in pretty dire straits financially, but then by hosting the landfill, the revenue that came to the town allowed them to do things like increase public school teacher salaries by double digit percentages, buy new fire trucks and police cars, um, refurbish uh, municipal facilities that were falling apart. And they even had revenue left over that every year around Christmas, every resident of the town got a check for, I forget if it was, it was close to a thousand dollars. Like here, here's, here's free money. But then the landfill filled and it was time for it to be closed and capped, which meant that revenue was no longer coming to that town. And the town was trying to figure out, okay, could they host another one? Could they expand the life of the landfill? Could it be made larger? Um, which is not to say towns that become hosts are always happy to be hosts, but there is remuneration in, in um, the form of, uh, they're, they're, they get a lot of money. And some rural areas are, they actually compete to become hosts for landfills sometimes for that very reason. The argument on the side of the waste management personnel is that landfills are built to far more exacting engineering standards in part because of a, just a thick set of regulations that they have to follow and that the pollution is far less than it was, say, even 10 years ago if you decide to host a landfill. Having said that, you're still going to have truck traffic or maybe train traffic, and you're still going to have smells, and you're still going to have, like, it's, an, it's a, a difficult neighbor. A landfill on your best day is a difficult neighbor because it's a landfill. So, but the economics of it, sometimes when there are activists trying to get a landfill closed, you will have people on the other side of the issue saying, no, we want to keep this open because the revenue is really important to our town right now. So it, it, as with almost everything to do with garbage infrastructure and politics, it becomes controversial pretty quickly. Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor Nagel. Um, thanks again for coming to share your exper experience with us today. It was really interesting to hear about the sort of like, uh, not, not only the policy, but also like the agency dimension sort of to gar garbage collection. It's definitely something like I haven't really encountered very much in uh, city and regional planning before. Um, I was, uh, I especially like, I guess my question is related, related to the similar, uh, related to the one that was just asked, because I was also sort of interested and intrigued by the map you showed of like different er different areas across like the Atlantic seaboard where New York City sends its trash, and I thought I thought that was interesting how it went. So uh, I thought that was interesting how it highlighted like a trend of, uh, as I understood it, decommissioning a lot of local a lot of local uh, waste disposal infrastructure and and uh, sending that and sending that job overseas. Um, as somebody who's not from New York, I'm not really sure I'm not really sure how to feel about that. Um, I don't know if my own city, Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, also does that, so I don't know if I can comment. Um, but like, uh, I guess, I guess, like, uh, I'm curious to ask: um, Do you think, uh, do you think, like, in the, um, the that sort of like shows a transfer, a transition from like a local waste disposal infrastructure to a more regional or even national one? And I guess I'm interested in, uh, in sort of asking whether you think that's going, that that's going to be a, tra a trend in the future. Like, do you think? The future of waste management is that is a return to more local uh, is a return to more local practice, more local infrastructure that would be more carbon efficient as opposed to trucking across the country. Or do you think it's going to be something where we, where waste management becomes more, I guess, sort of like the electric grid, where even even if informally, it's something that is it's something it's something that is managed where you have supply lines and connections going across regions and across the country. I don't, I don't see 
I, okay, I'm going to predict the future. Uh, I don't see the regional approach overtaking the international network that's in place right now, because that international network is, um, it, it has been in place for quite a while. And I will tell you that the single largest material export of the United States is garbage. Um, so there are international treaties and economic relationships and um, I don't see that any, any, anytime soon. And in terms of efficiencies, yes, certainly it would be far better if we could have a, a regional set of regional alternatives. Um, but partly the challenge is the scale. When I talk about municipal waste, remember that's at the very most 3% of the nation's total waste category. And, and the others are things like mining and nuclear waste and agricultural waste and medical waste and regional answers for that, that to, to contain those within regional context could in fact generate more harms than sending them to places that are perhaps um, better equipped to process or deal with them. Um, the, the, this, this, our conversation here today started with a land acknowledgement. And I'm grateful for that because it's, it, it doesn't happen everywhere yet, but I think it's a vital call for us to remember the far deeper history of where we are and how we're using the land and resources around us. And to give a, an optimistic answer to your question about, uh, you know, could we, could this become more regional? The entire structure, the entire economic rhythm of extraction, manufacture, transport, consumption, and discard, that unilinear horror, frankly, that's what has to be reconfigured. That's what has to be rewritten so that we're not any longer assuming um, there will be a place where there will be an away to reference the title to my talk. And in fact, let me share with all of you the, um, shoot, what did I just do? There's a, a book that came out this spring that I think is one of the most important books of environmental studies to come out in many years. Um, let me just, I have an image of it. Let me. Let me pull that up to make a pitch for it because to take your question and, and just push it out to its, um, in fact, what's the best way to do this? Hold on. Bear with me for just a moment, y'all. Okay. I have found when I try and share a PowerPoint to a particular slide, it takes me back to the very beginning and I didn't want to do that. So I made a screenshot of this book cover. So this is Max Lee Baron. They are a uh, scientist and, and artist, actually an activist and First Nations person in Canada. They teach at Memorial University in Newfoundland. Um, and this is the, this book just came out. The, um, I'm sure Cornell has a contract with Duke to, this is probably available in your library as a, in digital form. You can also download the introduction on the Duke University Press website. Um, Max's original research focused on plastics, specifically ocean and uh, water plastics, but uh, it evolved to this much, I think more profound and more inclusive and more important work that um, I highly, highly recommend. So I'm, I'm glad for your question, whose name I forgot to ask. What's your name? Uh, my name is Liam. Liam, thank you for your question, because I got to give a pitch for Max's book, which is one of the things I really wanted to be sure to do today. I don't think I've answered your question very well, because I don't really know the answer. I know what I hope. I know the trends that I see. Um, but right now, we are awash in mega scale infrastructures and arms and systems.
All right. Well, thank, uh, thanks a lot for giving, uh, sharing your honest thoughts on this question. I really appreciate it. Hi there, um, my name is Natalie Deduck, um, and I have a brief question, but I think one that relates well to the previous two. So I was hoping if you could give some of your thoughts and opinions on waste to energy and how you see that playing out in different communities um, in America and possibly how that relates to other countries and what they're doing. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question, Natalie. Um, waste to energy is a third rail issue, uh, meaning if you, in, in some environmental and waste management circles, if you touch it, you die, because it's so controversial. Waste, waste to energy facilities built today actually generate less uh, harm to the air than a landfill. Um, so if we're talking about um, air pollution, ironically, a waste to energy facility is a better choice. Waste to energy though creates, there is always ash and the ash is often highly toxic. So that will have to go somewhere. So where does that go? Uh, it usually ends up in a landfill somewhere, probably a landfill that is permitted for hazardous waste. So in the United States, we have fewer waste energy facilities than many other countries. It's far more common in Asia. It's far more common in parts of Scandinavia. In fact, you, you may have seen headlines a couple of years ago that Oslo was running out of garbage for its waste energy facility and wanted to import garbage from other countries to keep, to keep those, literally to keep those fires burning. Um, there is some cutting edge, I will say almost boutique research happening to take that, uh, the, the fly ash, the, the what's left over from incineration and through a process called pyrolysis, turn it into what is essentially an inert glass brick. And you can then use that as a building material, which is a pretty cool option, um, except that it's hugely expensive. It has not yet proven feasible to scale it up. So it's really only happening in sort of experimental ways uh, in, in a few places in the world right now. One of the ironies of waste energy, I went to a seminar sponsored by the Solid Waste Association of North America a couple of years ago. SWANA, that organization specializes in, um, th they are a consortium of municipal solid waste professionals. And it was, this was all about zero waste. And I was very excited to learn from them, how can we transition municipal systems to zero waste? The seminar was all about waste energy. Because the argument went, if I take trash that would go to a landfill or just be burned, just burned, but I'm using it as a source of fuel, it's no longer waste. Now it's a, it's a feedstock for energy for the grid, right? Which struck me as very frustrating and very, um, like you're just playing with language here. This is not... We've been doing waste energy in one form or another. The very first incinerator in the United States opened on Governor's Island in 1885. It was a disaster. But then in 1903, there was a, an incinerator that was built next to the Williamsburg Bridge on the Manhattan side to power the electricity for the lights on the bridge, one of the first um, structures that was, was illuminated with electric lights. So we've been, we've been playing with waste energy for a long time to say, oh, well, it's actually, you know, now it's zero waste. Like, no, that is, no. <laughs> However, it's not always the worst choice. If we're, if we're looking at a series of unfortunate choices, a landfill or an incinerator, you have to look very closely at the specific technology and context. Um, and also the, where, is it, where is it cited? All of those questions before you can say, oh yeah, you would never want incinerator, you'd always choose a landfill instead. Not necessarily. So it, it uh, as with so many of these questions, I don't have a tight, neat answer. Um, I will tell you the politics and the emotions around it run pretty hot, no pun intended. If you come out and say, I think incineration waste energy is a better choice than landfilling, people will start throwing rotten eggs at you, um, which 
could be composted, so why are they throwing them at you? But anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, let me give a pitch for another absolutely superb book about these, these questions, especially about recycling. I don't have an image of it on, on easily accessible to show you, but um, it's called Recycling Reconsidered. The author is Samantha McBride. I'll put this in the chat. Um, along with Max Liberon's book, um, I consider it uh, absolutely essential in talking about anything to do with um, waste, recycling, diversion, um, materials that like what is actually in our, gar our waste stream and what are the regulations around these different categories and how did those come to be? Um, it's meticulous, it's extremely detailed, it's, um, it's, a, it's just a superlative work. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, hello, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Jack. I'm interested in sort of questions around sort of civil service, public service organizations and how they sort of recruit and retain talent and operate effectively. And you gave us a lot of how sort of the institutional culture of the uh, Sanitation Corps in New York was built up so that it can function very well. And I'm curious how the sort of New York case compares to um, the other sort of median sanitation department in other US major cities? And then what do you think the lessons to sort of other public service tasks, whether it be sort of the military or federal government from the New York City Sanitation Corps in terms of how they sort of develop a good culture around their work? So the New York City Department is the largest uniformed municipal sanitation workforce in the country. Um, and I will, I will tell you when the job is open, when you can apply through the civil service system to, to take the job, um, there are always between 80 and 100,000 applicants. Um, so it is a highly sought after job. It will assuming you do well in the tests, the written and the physical, it'll still be as long as a year or more to work through all of the next set of certifications and health clearances and whatnot that you need to pass to get hired. Um, but it, one of the great benefits of the job is the strength of the union. Local A31 is not big. There are only about 6,000 members. But the president is the co-leader of New York's Municipal Labor Council, which represents all 330,000 municipal workers. And they have, Local A31 has a, an outsized influence on city politics relative to its size. In other cities, it's becoming less and less common to have a municipal workforce responsible for for collecting household, for municipal waste collection. It's more and more private companies. Waste management is one of the very biggest um, and they have a workforce in cities all over the world um, as well as in the US. And the, the unions that represent those workers don't have the same um, clout. The private sanitation workers here in the city are um, members of Teamsters Local 813, and it has far less influence on anything to do with the job, the, the, the safety protocols, the consequences of um, injury and death, the uh, salaries, the working hours. Um, it's a far more difficult job and far less appealing on the private side in New York and in, and in many cities, uh, many other cities where it's private. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand your question about the, the relationship of the structure of the DSNY to federal or military or- I'm, I'm So basically as a sort of, you know, as a sort of public service institution of employment that's built a very strong and effective uh, institutional culture in terms of encouraging people to sort of do the job rather than just scrape by, um, what do you think the lesson is from the uh, sanitation department as a success in that regard 
that could be applied to sort of other public service positions or institutional cultures that aren't necessarily able to get that buy-in? One of the hardwired elements of the job in New York is that you, when you're on the street behind the truck, the public is watching you. And especially in the age of smartphones and cameras and whatnot, um, they, they are not only watching you, they're ready to see you do something they consider to be wrong and then call you on it and put it on social media and get you in trouble for it. I will say that has become a kind of um, uh, a default informal enforcement, if you will. Uh, at roll call often at the start of a day, you will have the superintendent or the supervisor remind the workers before they go out, people are watching and they've got their cameras up. So um, even if you're doing the job to the best of your ability, be aware that there are people out there wanting to kind of catch you up doing something wrong. There's also within the structure of that hierarchy, and, and this was Waring's innovation and it holds, there is a very, very bright accountability. By bright, I mean there's a bright light on if a route isn't clean, why isn't it clean, what went wrong, and who's responsible for that, that problem, because now it's a problem. It's, and because the sanitation workers union is so strong, it's generally the foreman, the supervisor, who's going to get in trouble for it, because the sanitation worker union can pretty much get complaints knocked down for a lot of different things, whereas the Officers Union is not as strong. That's um, SEIU Local 444. Um, but there's also the social side also is, uh, it, that's an element in the, how well the job has a kind of a cultural coherence, if you will. Um, the benevolent societies, which again, I haven't gone into detail about those, but the African-American, Emerald, that's Irish, Colombian, that's the Italian. There's, the, those are the three big ones and that, if you want to rise in the department, you want to make friends with people, officers who are in those uh, organizations, which then also applies to how well you're going to try to do the job because you want to make a good impression because that can help you advance your career. Um, there's also, there's uh, some of the smaller groups are the Asian Jade, the Hebrew Spiritual. There used to be a German one called Stuben. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, there's two for, there's the Latino and the Hispanic. It used to just be Hispanic, but they had a fight. So now it's two. Um, yeah, those are the, oh, and then there's the Holy Name, which is Roman Catholics. Uh, and you can join, you can join all of those regardless. Maybe you're not Roman Catholic. Holy Name is still glad to have you. The only one, you can join Hebrew spiritual, but he, even if you're not Jewish, but every organization has a, a, a perk that they offer their membership. And Hebrew spiritual, it's, it's a pretty big perk. You are guaranteed a plot in a Jewish cemetery that has a, there's a, a cemetery that has a designated area just for DSNY um, um, people who passed away. And they can't, if you're not Jewish and you join, Hebrew, you can't be buried there. Um, so that's the, only, that's the only limitation that I know of, which is a roundabout way of saying, I don't know if, I mean, I have family in the army. I don't know if there are benevolent societies in the army or in other branches of the military or in other sort of hierarchical institutional organizations, but it's a really important part of the job. Sanitation also with police, with fire, with transit. I think Con Ed has the same set of benevolent societies. So there's like a national, there are national organizations that reflect the affiliates um, in a bunch of different job categories. It's a fascinating, and there's been really good work done on it. Um, I can't think of the name of anybody off the top of my head, but there's been the fraternal, fraternal organizations um, are a key part of a lot of different labor categories, particularly uniformed workforces. But I don't know about the military. Right. Um, because we're running a little low on time, I'm going to ask people who have questions still to go up. Do you have a question? Why did you have a question? Okay, why is this one So if you ask your questions together, then perhaps Robin, you can answer them as you see fit given the allotment of time. We'll end at 2.20. Hi, Dr. Um, my name is Han Hong, and I 
have a little bit of related question. Um, you you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the relation of father and son uh, within the Department of Sanitation in New York, and I kind of interested in another part, a, 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 a somehow informal part. I mean, you met you in your lecture. You mentioned people living on barges, uh, little society that's nearby the boat, and they live together as a kind of societal community. Uh, I kind of interested that uh, when machinery took their places and and when governments like took over, where did they go? And did they like move to uh, move to other other areas in New York to do other informal works or they stay to do like? I don't know. Okay. That's the that, that's the the I don't know. And I I invite you to take up that exact question and, and find the answer. It would be such a rich research project for so many ways and so many reasons. Um, I don't know what happened to them and I don't know where they went. Um, and it's an excellent question. And I invite you to go out and learn the answer. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Nagel. Thanks for asking all these questions. Um, my name is Wyatt, and um, I saw so many parallels to the, um, the early days of New York sanitation to kind of how sanitation looks in countries across the world now. Like, for example, that the pictures of the giant machines on the heaps of garbage and people kind of living within and gleaning materials. Like, I, I visited a, a landfill in Ghana, and, and it looks almost exactly the same today. Um, so I guess that was just striking. And, and the question I wanted to ask was more about like over time, since um, you started documenting this work and forward, like the composition of our waste has changed and maybe the ways we've thought about it from mostly biodegradable things to a lot of now petro-based plastic things. I was just kind of curious how that shifted like the system and I guess how it was managed, where it went um, and, and how we think about it now. That's a whole little wad of questions all at once, Wyatt. So, um, but um, it did used to be far more organic material. Um, as plastics have replaced many of those earlier materials, um, two things have happened. We have increased the geological legacy of our wastes because plastics, of course, don't decompose at human timescales. They're more cousin to sort of nuclear timescales. Um, the management process has simply, so there were horses and carts, there were individual human beings, there are still individual human beings and now there are trucks. It's not that different. Um, as plastics have evolved, they've gotten lighter and lighter so that we are now, it's, we have more volume but less weight. And that changes things like how do you plan to fill a container that you're going to put on a barge or the back of a train car or a truck that then goes to its next destination. Um, but it hasn't, the, we used, so back in the colonial era, there were arguments about who got to collect manure from the streets that was then sold to regional farmers that would then grow the food that would then sell it back to New York, who would, then, I mean, it, and not just manure, but also night soil, which is the contents of outhouses, um, because it's quite a rich uh, material for obviously for agricultural purposes. We don't worry about that so much anymore um, in the same way. New York has 14 um, water treatment plants for, for treating sewage, more than any other city in the world. And in fact, the Newtown Creek facility, which I don't know if you all know about that one. It has those four egg-shaped, rather beautiful, um, they're, they're basically <laughs> huge pots full of stewing sewage. Um, that's the single largest in the world, and it isn't done yet. They've been building it for a long time. Anyway, um, the, the infrastructure, except that we don't dump at sea anymore in a formal way, and that workers are better protected and better paid and better, comp better compensated in, in a whole lot of other ways than say when we gleaned off of landfills and, and lived on what we could pull off the streets. Of course, people still, still do that. There's also a whole regulatory element here. And I realize I'm meandering, but 
you, if you wanted to go to a landfill that's still in full swing and be able to scavenge or glean material, you'd be hard pressed to find anywhere that would let you do that. Um, again, because of often lawsuit risks and, and fears. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm answering your question. I think I'm just sort of meandering. I packed a bunch in there. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, read Max's book. That's my, that's my concluding advice to, to you and to all of you, because she, they touch on um, a lot of the questions that y'all have asked, but in a, a much richer scale than just New York City. Um, in fact, they're, they don't deal with New York at all. Um, but the ideas and the, it's, I, it's just one of the most important books to be published in a very, very long time. I'll read it, thank you. Hi, Professor, uh, my name is Lee. I also have a question related to uh, Stanfield Selection. Slow, so, slow down a little bit, slow down a little bit. Okay. <laughs> So I also have a question related to uh, landfill set selection. So right now I understand why counties or communities want to be the host for landfill because it's portable. I will say that way. But uh, I wonder, my question is, I wonder what kind of, like who has the right to decide which county could be the host and like what kind of uh, stakeholders involved in making that decision? And also what's your criteria? Because I assume like, I assume you will not choose a very promising community to be the host. Uh, I don't know whether it's right, but I'm really curious about the criteria. Yeah, that's it. So th the decision is made by the leadership of whatever place is being considered as a host community. It can either happen that a private entity, a private waste management company, or a government will go to a county or a town and say, we would like to put a landfill here. And then the town, the whoever is in charge, like, is there a mayor? Is there a town council? Is there a county supervisor? Who's making decisions on behalf of the people who live there? They're going to be the key decision makers. And generally there's also things where, you know, you have public forums and people come and debate and they, they, they like public comment periods, um, although not always. Um, the, the flip side is a town or a county that goes to a private company or a, a city or a state and says, we want to host a landfill. And then the negotiations are initiated that way. There's also, there are, states that have said to New York in particular, we refuse to take any garbage from New York City, but the constitution free commerce clause, I forget what number it is, but there is a, a the, the free commerce clause, I think I'm misnaming that, of the United States constitution forbids states from forbidding some forms of business. So Virginia cannot, refuse garbage from New York City. Virginia can keep a, can, can make it as minimal as possible by saying, all right, we will only accept a certain tonnage and make that tonnage very small. But when this particular issue on sort of exploded in the mid 1990s, Rudy Giuliani was mayor of New York City <laughs> and he was quoted in several media sources as saying, look, People from Virginia come to New York and they go to Broadway and they enjoy the museums and they love the culture of New York City. So in return, they have to take our garbage and they have nothing to say about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> impressively arrogant, uh, and, but I'm sure he's quite sincere. Um, but so the stakeholder question, it's gonna vary from place to place. Environmental justice as a national and international movement um, Robert Bullard, who has written extensively on this, points to a county in rural North Carolina as being the origin point of what has become the international environmental justice movement when a county there was cited as the host of a toxic landfill, toxic hazardous waste material landfill. And some local church people found out about it and they said, no, no. So someone in the county made that decision on behalf of the county, 
but without any kind of an inclusive decision-making process. And these activists rose up and said, no, we will, we will not allow this to happen. And that blossomed into what has become an international, an international movement of many different expressions of environmental justice, or rather protests of and trying to bring about corrections of environmental injustice. That might be a good place to, to leave this because that's a big, very rich field now that I'm sure many of you are, are acquainted with already. And garbage always points in that direction anyway. All right. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Let's give Dr. Bailey a round. Thank you for being such a good audience. And for your questions, really good questions. Well, if the last speaker was any judge, there will be people reaching out to you. This is not the last you have heard from us. But you've given us so much to think about and so much more reading material to, to pursue. So many appreciations. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.